And my program uh, is, and I have a slide on this, but my program is based in city planning, part of urban design, and we're responsible for a number of projects, um, including policy and working with private development, and we also work with the culture division, which is another arm uh, in economic development at the City of Toronto. They have a public art program, and we work very closely together. What I would like to do is um, find the forward and speak to you about, uh, I'll be talking about our role, city planning's role in public art, uh, some of the policies and background. I want to give you context for the actual uh, implementation of City Place, um, and I'll, then we'll give some examples about working with the private and public sector and some of the results and lessons learned. Um, so, uh, you know that public art has been in place in the United States since um, 1959 in Philadelphia. So part of what we want to do with PAN is lessons learned and, and not to reinvent the wheel. But I mean, there's a number of examples in the United States that, and now I think there are hundreds of programs with public art policies. In Canada, we also have, and I know this list would be much longer, but starting in the 1950s um, with the uh, province of Quebec, National Capital Commission. But there, the City of Toronto, 1985, we introduced our public art policy and a number, and a metro, which is a, which was, it, it, it doesn't exist any longer but another level of government with, with Toronto, and so on. And you see all of the cities now and many more across Canada that have public art policies. Um, we were in the 80s in the city of Toronto looking at how to include and use public art to activate spaces, not work on its own, but basically to change a parking lot into a park, an open space, and then this is the Flatirons building down in St. Lawrence District, an uh, older part of, of Toronto. We changed the rezoning so it could be live, work, people would live in the spaces, feel comfortable in an area that was largely industrial, and then also ran a competition for this work by Derek Bazant. Um, which is still there today and it's still wonderful and it's like a landmark. You know you've arrived in the theatre district which is also a very much a neighbourhood as I said. Um, in the mid 80s and then in early 90s we started looking at public art policies. We had a program of, of um, planning for city with policies here and then I think the most important thing maybe I could say to all of you is we have public art in our official plan. That's the level, the highest level for planning cities. And we have a very robust uh, policy. Now that's with the former city of Toronto, but we in, so 1991 we introduced public art policies into the official plan. We started doing a lot of sculptures. Uh, we've got many examples that were happening in the 90s. At the, at the left here, that's by Barbara Steinman, who's from Montreal. Um, this is uh, Evan Penny. And this is Nish Kapoor his first public art private development permanent commission in the world and it happened in Canada in in downtown Toronto and so we're very proud of that and he is too. Um, the city amalgamated uh, in the late 90s and so the program that we used to we did run basically took this part of Toronto. Now our program is this part. So we're very busy. And I hear everyone talking about lack of resources. It's the same in Toronto. It's, we're all the same. You know, we have a lot of public art going on, but we're never, ever enough with staff and resources at all. Um, but in our new official plan, when we did amalgamate, uh, we introduced a number of policies, again, for the new city of Toronto. And you can see there's a couple of pages in the official plan. And again, that's really the most important thing. It gives guidance, it gives direction to anyone who's building and creating and planning for public art in the city. Um, this is some, these are some of the policies. And, uh, you know, to, uh, to introduce public art master plan, building reserves, encouraging art and public, uh, public initiatives with our agencies like the Toronto Transit Commission, the Police Board, a number of agencies as well as what we do in the City of Toronto and then our capital budget, all major <coughs> municipal buildings and structures and then also this is the key part for this presentation is the inclusion of public art in significant private developments. We then have a, in our OP, we talk about uh, official uh, built form and how public art can make the buildings more attractive and engaging and interesting. And then we have what's called Section 37 Community Benefits. That's part of the Ontario Planning Act. It's a section in the Planning Act that allows us, and I know 
in all provinces, you have something that's similar, but not quite this provision. Same thing, it's about density bonusing. But the important thing is we're not approving buildings so that we can get public art, or we can get heritage, or daycare, or open space. The menu is long. Um, it, it's very important that the building and the built form and the setbacks is, is satisfactory to planning. And then we look at what the amenities would be. I've actually had people who've approached me and said, well, I could do a building this big and you'll get public art. Well, no, that's not the way it works. So, um, We have a, a guidelines and I have a copy, one copy but on our website. We have guidelines for the amalgamated city and a number of topics. And this is written for the developers, but also for planners and urban designers and basically how to make it happen and the, 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 the guidelines and the rules for it. Um, we also secure, and I'm not suggesting you can read this, but for on-site, and on-site being when a developer will commission public art for on their property, so we call that on-site, but we also secure funds from the developer if they want, if they choose, or if we're looking, we have an initiative that we would like money to be dedicated towards. We have a plan for, there's a street called John Street, called a cultural corridor. There's a park that we want to build, so we ask the developer to contribute some of their public art funds towards city property. So that's the on-site and the off-site. Um, we also have, um, uh, oh, that slide is out of order, and I apologize for that, but that's okay. Let's just see where we're going here. Um, also, city infrastructure. Um, we, uh, we identify opportunities when the city builds projects. And there's another division called the culture division, which actually runs the, the projects, runs the competitions for these projects. This is by Louis Jacob, and it's an underpass, and it's pretty fabulous. Um, for the developers, though, we really understand, or they understand, that public art really does contribute to the urban character of their developments, and they're very keen. You know, they weren't at first. It's like, okay, well, where do you want the art? Where do you want the bronze? <laughs> on a plinth, and we said, well, you can do that, but there's other ways to do it, and please just take advantage of our program and use the art so that it, it enhances your development. There's another project here. Uh, that was um, Carl Tesson, the first one. This is James Turrell in the lobby of an office. So there's been some discussion about maintenance and conservation. We know that that's a, 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 a challenge, but if it's in the, uh, in the lobby, of an owner, you know that it'll be taken care of because that's when they walk in, that's where it first shows. So the private developer percent for public art program, we actually, once it's secured, and it is uh, a voluntary program until they agree to it, and then it's mandatory. <laughs> well, it is, I mean, it is. <laughs> it's part of the zoning bylaw for agreeing to the zoning, okay, the density. And, and there's agreements, they're on title, we report to council on what it is the developer will provide. Part of what we're looking for from the developer is to plan for public art. So they bring in a plan, and it's, got, it's everything but what it'll be. So we want, what are the opportunities on site? How will they implement it? What's the estimated budget? How are they going to select the artists? And by the way, the developers do have more options than maybe a civic-run program where we're dealing with, uh, we want to be open and transparent, but with the developers, they could do an open call, they could do by invitation or a direct commission. So they have more flexibility. If they're inviting artists, who are the artists? Who will be on the panel to deliberate on the art? It's very important that we have a they have a community representative as well, so we help them with that. And then public relations program and a little bit about conflict of interest and so on. This plan comes to city planning. We review it. It goes to the Toronto Public Art Commission, which is a group of volunteer advisors. And for the most part, then we report the plan out to council. We were talking about um, uh, some controversy yesterday and councillors looking at uh, art and saying that's not, that's not art to me. Well, we actually don't report on the outcome. We report on how they're going to do it. And if we support how they will do it, then we, we have to be satisfied with the outcome as well. We're not going to judge them. However, the developer does have veto. Once they go through this whole process, if they're not happy with it, they can say, okay, I'm going to start again. But they can't credit all the money they've spent towards that date. Okay, so we want to make sure that they're very happy with the process as well. This program has teeth to it. I've got here 
Public art plan equals building permits. We have their attention <laughs> because we can stop building permits. The at grade building permits if they haven't produced a public art plan. So it's got the teeth. And that's and one reason why the program is based in planning, okay? Because it's part and parcel of development approvals. Um, we do a lot of integrated public art. So when you plan for public art, the, there's 214 windows that go all along here and commissioned uh, Barbara Asman, a local photographer. You don't do that after the project. You plan it a few years in advance. So we're asking for the developers to do that. Now, here's, we're, here's the topic. Here's the railway lands, which is the topic, city place, which I want to talk about. I have a very special guest here today. I want to introduce Gabriel Lung. Gabriel is the Director of Development for Concord ADEX and is responsible for a number of projects in Toronto, including city place. So Gabriel, if you could come up. I, have to, I think I have to turn this off. Yep. Hello? Oh, okay. I'm glad we haven't had a building permit revoked yet. <laughs> Actually, I'm very honored to be on the same stage with uh, Jane Perdue, the uh, Public Art Supremo of Toronto. Can I call you that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, as you may know, I mean, um, Concord Pacific and Concord ADEX, um, we are together. We are the largest um, condominium developer in Canada. And uh, we, 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 our, our specialty is master bank communities, anywhere from 20 to 40 to 60 to 200 acre sites. And when we plan master plan community, it's not just an infield building. So it's really an entire neighborhood we're planning. So the, apart from the, the privately developed condominiums and so on, the public facilities are just as important for to build up the community, schools, community, daycare, nice parks and so on. And of course, public art, right? And for us, um, public art is a very, very important part of, of the project. It's, it's like, a, uh, like the, the final touches. It's like wearing jewelry. I mean, they are small, but they attract a lot of attention, and they add a lot to the, to the character of the neighborhood. Um, that's why we invest a lot of um, uh, time and effort to sort of do good art, which is appropriate to context. And as Jane was saying earlier on, in the, in the old days, a lot of the developers, when they think of art, it's really a pedestal on sculpture in the corner of a building somewhere. Um, but for us, I mean, we, we want to do art to respond to the context. Either they can still be standalone art, nothing, nothing wrong with that, but they can be art which is integrated, sometimes with landscaping, sometimes with architecture. And there are many, many ways to do it. Um, as you can see later on in the, in, in the presentation in Concord City Place in, in Toronto, we have actually engaged on a, lot, a whole range of different kind of artwork uh, in different kind of scales, different kind of approaches and artists from all over the world. Uh, but along the way, we always work with um, Jane and the city um, uh, urban design team to, to so they give us the, the right guidance and encouragement so that we know we are heading down the, the, the route which the city is also uh, happy with. Um, I must say that, I mean, that every time we have been doing art so far, the city has been quite happy with the outcome, and the public seems to be quite happy with the outcome. So we keep, we'll, be, we'll be keeping on, on, on that track, and we look forward to many more years of uh, working with Jane and your team. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, what eventually became City Place. It's the railway lands. There was a slide earlier out of order. But basically, it was industrial lands for uh, 150 years. And then the, this property, which is very large. I don't know, uh, how large is the railway? About 60 acres. OK, so very large lands. Uh, it went through a number of um, uh, rezoning. Uh, it went to the Ontario Municipal Board, which is this agency we have in, the, in, in, in Ontario that basically, you know, takes over. You've probably heard about the OMB, and uh, some provinces have it, some not. But it took one year in the courts because the, the, the former developer was challenging a number of aspects, including public art. And I was on the stand being drilled by the lawyers about, you know, why, would, why should we do this? So, and then they said, well, we'll do it, but we'll do it our own way, and so on. But uh, rezoning lands, industrial lands, that's where the rail came through, that's why it's <coughs> called the Railway Lands West, and making it ultimately into an area where people could live. So that was the plan. That's what it looked like for 60 acres. That's what it looked like in the, in the mid 80s. So it, there's the rail, nothing, okay? And the gardener is there, the rail, and the above, above city place or above the lands, it was the neighborhood, but this was going to be a brand new neighborhood. Um, 
Historically, oh, there's that slide. I guess we had two. So there you go, and basically what I said. But so it took the rezoning in the 90s, 94, 97, precinct agreements, secondary plans, going through the 90s, urban design guidelines. There was a public art master plan that was initiated in, the, in 1998, and then I think Concord ADEX purchased the land in 99. And then I'll show you, then we started having charrettes, thinking about what the possibility would be. So basically, public art has been contemplated on these lands since the late 90s. So it's a long program. Um, there's the, a, a charrette that we had in 2002. Gabriel was there. I like this one because that was my director. And then a city, um, George Dark of Urban Strategies. It looks like I'm kind of telling them what to do. <laughs> Maybe I was. Public art was there. The, the important thing is public art was part of the planning process. Um, and this is what's a rendering of what City Place was going to be. So for s people who um, know Toronto, this is uh, what's called the Rogers Centre now. There's the water, there's the railway, and here's the contemplation of these towers. Okay, so that's the rendering of what, what this neighbourhood could be. Um, when you plan for public art, and we have a program that is based in planning and urban design, they get it. Okay, so you're not going to do art that Mm, obliterates what's already there, and you think about street views and terminus, you think about pedestrian, public realm, and so this is the key part of public art in, in this particular land, and so we planned for public art. We, there was already an existing memorial, you may know it, the Chinese railway workers, so there's the railway. It's a memorial to uh, our ancestors, everyone who built the railway, and it's a memorial to the people who built it and died for us to be able to travel across Canada. So we had this, the railway there, or the memorial, so we needed to ensure that that wasn't um, forgotten and uh, the vision of it was, was lost. That's the railway lands, or at least the railway workers. Um, we also planned for something here at this street here, at the terminus. That's a community centre, an amenity building, and so we knew there was going to be a large-scale sculpture there, which then Gabriel and Public Art Management ran a competition for, and that came to um, the Barca Volante, uh, uh, Francesco uh, Gassitue, a Chilean artist. So you see the scale of it. So they knew that that would be the size, the scale that would be needed, but also that you could see it from afar. Um, the underpass. So this is Spadina Avenue and you walk underneath. It's not a very pleasant situation. So part of what they, we were trying to do was to, or the developer wanted to do, was to make it a little bit easier. And so there's the underpass from afar, lights included into the underpass, and then to make it feeling like a safer place. It's modest what was done, but you know, there's where people walk their dogs and want to walk underneath the underpass. And so just to make it a little bit more comfortable. Flower power, some of you, may know this. Um, this is where Flower Power is. Flower Power is by Marc de Souvereau. Marc de Souvereau was, com uh, was invited into a competition, uh, sorry, into a, uh, a sculpture symposium in the late 60s. He and a number of other sculptors came to Toronto. He created two works, Flower Power and uh, No Shoes. He built it. It was in a, high, in a large park. It's called High Park. Built it, installed it, put it in, he left town and we didn't do anything about it. It just fell apart. So we didn't, we didn't have a maintenance, conservation. We didn't have any money to take care of a very, very important work. Mark de Souvereau was not pleased with us, with the city of Toronto, as you can imagine. I mean, you all know him and you know how important an artist he is. So through Concord and some work with the city, because this is city owned, this is a city owned work, Concord and the city, but mostly through Concord's initiative, they paid for that work and the other work to be shipped down to his studio in, North, in uh, New York, northern New York State, to be refurbished, to be basically to be fixed up, and then brought the work back up. Here it is in situ, there's a rendering, and if you look at the back one again, um, I mean, it's so high profile, it's absolutely amazing where this work of art is. So there's a combination of public sector, first of all, not doing the right thing, and then realizing that we blew it, and the private sector coming in and saying, you know, we would like to work with you, and we would like this artwork on our lands. This is a linear park, and it's so prominent, and he's just, he was just so thrilled. It was really a wonderful experience. Um, the railway lands, the pedestrian bridge, see the red here? 
That's where this bridge is now. And we were asked, um, we asked the developer to build a bridge because they create, were creating this community. But, you know, I mean, you could get there uh, down Spadina. You could get there from other places. But we wanted a pedestrian bridge. So Concord Air Decks, their responsibility was to build a bridge. Okay, that's part of the amenity that they produced. So they had a competition and they invited, it was also Francesca Gassatue, because they'd worked with him and they understood what he was capable of doing. So Francesco was on the design team for this bridge. So you see the scale of it. It's just amazing. And it's really a lovely work of art. It's industrial, it's infrastructure, it's, it's, it's um, functional, but you can see, and sort of like um, Kath, and you know, the before and after, what's a bridge like? without an artist, and maybe what's a bridge like with an artist. We know it's something, a very different kind of experience. So that was brought to the citizens from the developer. Um, so some other examples. Matt Mulliken, you would know his work, a, a pretty prominent American artist. He was asked, or we were asked, to, there's a parking lot there, and could the public art kind of cover it up. I'm sure you ask this all the time. No, not all the time, but basically something's bad and bring the artist in to make it better. So it's kind of like what the parsley on the pig, you know. I mean, it's not a good situation to do. It really isn't. But look at the scale. I mean, look what he did do. And this, again, was because of the developer saying, we want this to be prominent. We want this to be interesting. That's a maquette down there. That's one of the images that he used. And it worked, but it's certainly not something you would want to encourage. Um, it should be designed better in the first place. Um, we also have Between Two Towers. This is by Marlene Hilton Moore. This is the amenity, uh, the bridge for these two towers. So her work is this, the detail in here, and then at grade, these leaf uh, templates. It's very beautiful. Um, uh, Jackie Ferrara, uh, a number of you might know Jackie's work. And this, all this is, is a wall, and it's flat. But you can see, because of the way that she's designed it, it's really beautiful and it looks like it's two-dimensional, right? Uh, at least three-dimensional. Um, and also, the, the people, the, the crew working on it, you know, they don't often have a chance to work on something like that. It's bricks, right? But to be able to work with an artist was a real pleasure for them. Um, I did want to <coughs> mention, though, that, and I don't know if Gabriel knows this, but there's a proposal that's come in from the Rogers Center, which is the sports center right there, that they want to change this plaza. And the first renderings we saw, trees, there's all kinds of things, you can't even see the art. So we've sent it back. <laughs> but you know, you need to know, I mean, they need to know that these works of art are created. And then you can't just come in and put something in front of them. So we have that in all of the agreements. Any changes to the artwork. Luckily, we have a lot of people interested and supportive in the city, but also you know, you engage the artist. If we have to bring Jackie back, we will, but I doubt that we will have to. Basically, we'll make sure trees are a good thing, but we'll make sure that they're not um, camouflaging or obliterating the art with blue jays and different kinds of things like that. So also then, also to say, planning for a park. Um, this here is an eight-acre park. And so it's wonderful to have sculptures and design and so on, but again, through Gabriel Lung and Concord Adex, they wanted this park to be really special. So again, you plan in advance. They introduced, a, they had a competition. They brought Douglas Copeland in, and most of you would know Douglas. Uh, he's been doing a lot in public art because he's very clever. And I also would like to say, I mean, he was known as a writer. And I think in the field of public art, I'm not sure you have to be a sculptor. I'm not sure. I think it's about the idea. And then if you bring a team together that can implement it, and we have examples in Toronto, and I'm sure there's examples across North America, it's about the idea and then, and then figuring out how to do it. So Doug was known because as a writer. He was brought on the team, though, to work with um, Phillips, Far Farvig, and Smallenberg, who are based in Vancouver, and then the planning partnership that's in Toronto. Um, it works, you know, you have to have a, a local landscape architect who's registered with, with Ontario, and you would do that with an architect and so on. So, brought Doug in, and here's one of the renderings to plan this park. Um, Doug, as you know, is very interested in our Canadian history. So he was looking at Tom Thompson and the canoe and some of the history there and used that as a, as a source. And now there's a canoe there. 
It's called Canoe Landing Park. The park is so successful that they've named the park, uh, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the developer, it was the public that named it, um, and it's a canoe landing, okay? There's a canoe there. Now, I want to point out, though, it's kind of a joke because the water is down here. And I think Doug's saying, how do you get to the water? <laughs> yes, it's very clever. But he also, these are giant fishing bobbers. This is a lovely plaza, a beaver dam, and here's some renderings up here. So again, about Canadiana. This doesn't happen uh, by just placing art in, in a space. It's all integrated and all planned. This is a, a, a tribute to Terry Fox. It's a, I think it's a two kilometer run. There's a run tribu in tribute. We, we all know how important Terry Fox was. We all have seen the sculptures across Canada and there's more proposals for the, his figure and that's fine. But this is another way of commemorating him and so there's light standards with his photo, there's some remnants, one of his socks from running, there's a photograph of it. And so on, so just a different way to remind us how important a figure he was and something that people can use. Um, and here's the, the, the plaza. Planning for public art, neighborhood plaza, the neighborhood uh, farmer's market. Because now there are how many people are living in City Place? Around 13,000. 13,000 people. Be Eventually be 20. Okay. So, it, oh, and what I didn't say is, and they're not on right now, but I think it's one of those, if you push it, the water will come up. So the kids love that, but I don't think you do that when the farmer market's happening. <laughs> but it's very playful in that way. A few others that are down. This is all still City Place. John McEwen, this beautiful uh, sculpture by John with the bear. Um, this is by Catherine Harvey, as you can see, Gardner Streams, so it's named after the gardener or play on the gardener, and with the traffic going by. Very colorful and very beautiful under installation. This is a brand new one by Pierre Poussin in a garden. That's it in the daytime. Here it is in the evening. It's really lovely, and I think quite modest in, in budget as well. Uh, and we can talk about that afterwards. I think that might be a question you might have for Gabriel. Um, Adrian Golner, who's based in uh, Ottawa. So one of the things that they wanted to do was to create kind of hugging the whole development, giving it some presence at night. Now, people live there, like you said. Thousands of people live there. You don't want the lights on all night. <laughs> but they're on for about an hour and a half when it's dusk. And then they're just bringing the whole neighborhood together in a very beautiful way. There's another photograph. I didn't take that. I don't know where we got that, but it's pretty fabulous. Just showing that this is a place of character and identity through, some, through light. Um, this is uh, Alan Vihand. He's with Great Gulf. He's also very supportive of public art. Great Gulf is another developer. I apologize to Gabriel. I could have an article with Gabriel in it, but I don't. Not today. But it shows that the, you know, the press love it, right? And so if the press like it, so too do the developers. Um, I was asked to put together five slides um, back in June for another conference. So in five, there, here's one slide. Here's on City Place. It's all City Place. This, by the way, is the canoe. So it gives you the size of the scale of that park. That's the canoe. This is, this is the real Toronto. That's Pierre Poussin as well, who did the variegations in, in, uh, in, in green. So parks and open space. They've created the infrastructure. This is another one that I haven't spoken about, but you can see the art being integrated into the built form. Uh, color. There's, we've, well, we could ask, uh, include Pierre's now. Um, we have a catalog here. Concorde Dex produces catalogs by the artists. And this is, this is absolutely beautiful, the one, the red sculpture, as you can see, it's just stunning. Um, this, is, this is the interior here. This is what the people here, I want to be in that pool. But that's what you see when you're inside the building. This is what the public would see. And then, um, and then light. I didn't show this, but at Nuit Blanche, uh, Gabriel offered the bridge. And so there was a light installation, only for 24 hours. But it's something we're thinking about. Maybe we could do that on a permanent basis because it's, it's just really cool. And so there's another compliment um, uh, of how you can incorporate uh, public art and in, uh, through, through light and color. So in summary, and then I want to bring Gabriel up here because I'm losing my voice, but basically you need strong policies and you need buy-in and you need to plan in advance and you need to be lucky enough to work with a developer such as Concorde Dex that they understand the potential and the value of public art and what it can do for their buildings 
and helping to bring people to want to live and work and play in their area. You also should be identifying the opportunities very early on and look for a range of types. So it's not all, there's nothing wrong with standalone, but it's not all the same. So there's just a, a variety of ways that you can include artists into the, the built form or as a standalone sculpture. And then of course the inclusion of the public and the private sector. I think that's it. So, I thank you, but I'd like Gabriel now to come up here. Okay. So, yeah, I'll turn this off. Um, we have a, we have to, uh, this has to be off so that he can speak. So we had a bit, bit uh, few logistics here. But I'd like to open it up now because I know I speak very quickly. I know I've given you a lot of information and question for me or question for Gabriel, we'd be pleased. Um, yes. That's more public art than I've seen in 10 minutes ever. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, you know, you talked about strong policies, and in, in your OP you have the policy, which is the right one, which is to encourage the use of public art and new developments. Can you unpack that word encourage for me? Because it's more of an ask than a demand. Yes. So I'll leave my mic on. And the question was, I think you've heard, but we have someone who's, uh, Jeff, who's videotaping this. So basically he wanted to know what does encourage developers. So the way that it works with the City of Toronto is that if a developer is building as of right, in other words, the zoning is already in place and they have the right to build whatever it is, then we don't have the opportunity to, to um, encourage public art or any other amenities. We certainly ask for them, we talk about them, we might have it in a secondary plan, there might be a master plan, but it is, it's an as of right. But if they want to do what we call an official plan amendment, a rezoning, in other words, they want to go bigger, they very rarely want it smaller, okay? Then we ana analyze the, the project and the proposal. And as I said earlier, it's really about, let's look at the built form first. Let's look at this building. So we encourage the developers to think about public art, but we have a menu. It's uh, heritage, restoration, daycare, uh, public open space, not parks. Parks is a separate <coughs> levy for that, but open space. There's a number of amenities or what we call community benefits that we look for. And frankly, there's, there are buildings that may qualify for public art. And oh, by the way, the threshold is 10,000 square meters. That's where we start. So these are big buildings. That's where you start. So, uh, you know, you talk to the developer, the architect. Is there a possibility for public art? So on. So we're encouraging them. Once they agree, okay, then it's mandatory because they have agreed based on the density bonusing. And that's where I talked about a little bit earlier with the agreements, with the zoning bylaw. They have the obligation. And it's, then it's tied to building permits. It's also tied to if they don't fulfill that obligation, by the time they're ready to occupy the building, then we get a letter of credit. So it's, it's really rigorous and they take it seriously. Did that answer? Yeah, can I ask a follow up? Sorry, just in a sure. super, super detail, but I'm super, super curious. Where are you I'm from? from you're from Regina, okay. Yeah. Um, so do you feel like departmentally there's some uh, positioning of the different departments who have items on that community amenity list that are bonusable? Like do you feel like that's kind of a team approach or do you feel like different departments are pushing for different community amenity items or? Well, I, I, so asking whether there's, there's, I guess, competition between yeah. the amenities. I suppose there's some, but I mean, it's a balanced approach. Uh, I think it's really important to have affordable housing. It's important to have green space, parks. I mean, I'm a planner, I get that. So we're not going to go in there and say, you have to have public art and forget about the heritage. No, I think it really is, um, a unified approach, um, and, but it really does depend on, on, as we've talked about the other day too, it depends on who's in the other department and what kind of relationship you have with these people. And I've, I've had planners who have said to me, you know, I tried for public art, but we had to get this, this, and this, and sorry, and I go, okay. You know, I mean, the, the community planner is the one who holds it all together. So I don't know that there's competition. I think we do work together pretty well, but there is an awful lot of, that is asked of the developer. And there's going to be a point where they say, that's it, no more, I can't give you any more. We often ask for 1% of the gross construction costs, so we might negotiate. And they may say, how about 400,000? And I say, well, 
What can you do with that? You know, we actually have in our guidelines a minimum of 150,000 on site. We took the 1% for public art from the United States and from other cities across Canada. And I, I get a little glib in these meetings sometimes, but when they say, you know, I can't afford 1%, I'm saying, well, you can, then you can't afford 99. I mean, what are we talking about here? <laughs> so, so we do negotiate. So it isn't always the full 1%, and that's because there are other amenities that are being sought. Okay, okay. Yes, maybe a question for Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. I've got one for Gabriel. Sorry, hi. Um, in terms of your, it, it seems that Okay, um, I think the question um, is uh, whether Concord, we um, have a, a eureka moment to sort of switch on the public art light or whether it's something which is gradual and so on. Um, I think the, the, the very frank answer is that we grew more and more into it. There's not really a light switch kind of moment. We knew since day one when we purchased the site and there's all these negotiations about, about uh, well, the city as to what our obligations are to provide bridges and schools and, uh, and park space and so on. And public art is one of the things which was negotiated in. So we knew we have to do it anyway. So at the beginning, um, we, 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 we did the public art in the first project, which is the glass bridge. Um, and um, that was, compared to what we're doing currently, that's slightly smaller scale, so to, so to speak, is because the budget of that one is not, is not as high as uh, it could be. What happened is, at that time, we knew that one day we have to build, we'll be building bridges and the eight-acre park. So we're trying to sort of save some money for, for a rainy day in the future. We know we have to spend it, but might as well spend more money in a concentrated manner, like in the park, right? So we gradually build up our, our momentum. And throughout the years of working on the public art programs, uh, we sort of got better at it and become more versatile in, 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 in being like art connoisseur, so to speak, and then don't start to know how to go out to, to the right artists for different kind of contexts, so we gradually grow into the role. And that's why you can see in the slide just now, we did a whole spectrum of different approaches to art. And, um, and, and I guess, I mean, that's really just the way we, we are. And, and of course, I mean, looking back now, we knew that uh, th this is actually a, a really good addition to, to City Place. I mean, when people walk around in City Place, nighttime, daytime, they can see all this art around them. They really, they really adds to the atmosphere of, 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 of City Place. So um, this is something which we look back on really proudly, and uh, we, we're glad we are so in the, immersed in the public art program. We live in a cold climate, <laughs> and we want art for at that time period as well. Yeah, sure it does. Yeah, absolutely, because, uh, because we do, uh, you know, we're Canadians. <laughs> we go outside, we play. Oh, I don't play in the snow, but some people do. <laughs> or you walk, I have a dog. I do walk my dog every day. So it's important. But yes, I, I, that's a good question. But I mean, I think when you're, when you're evaluating the proposals, um, you talk about that this is, it's not for one season. It's an all year. It's also daytime and nighttime presence. And then also about uh, managing the maintenance and, and how, how the materials can, can last through the winter. I think that's very important. We've had a couple of projects. I haven't been involved in them at all, but they've been competitions for on the, on, at the beach on the, and, and uh, hubs. Yeah, I think Winnipeg has done that and Helena, I think, was here earlier. You know, celebrating the winter time and so making uh, hubs designed by artists or by industrial designers and so on um, so yes it does come into play but frankly the taking of the photographs is a lot more pleasant to do in the day <laughs> in, the, in the warmer weather but it that's an important consideration but i think it's really more about quality and sustainability on a seasonal basis We, we, we do take into account uh, the, the long winter days 
when I mean long long winter nights when there's no 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 brightness in in, in the sky. So uh, you notice that that a lot of the art we we do put a, we put a lot of attention to the to the lighting, either to lit up the art, or the art is light by itself, right? And um, and that's why actually, I, to, to be frank, I find that when I walk, walk around city place in the nighttime, it's actually more interesting than the daytime because. Probably art wise, right? I mean, at daytime, I mean, probably art still is lost amongst all the things happening. You can see clearly. Nighttime, you can see all this different interesting little lighting, the roof lighting, and 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 the lighting in the in the candle lighting park and so on. Those really draw your attention, and that adds so much more in the night nighttime and the winter time. So so um, we always make sure that uh, when we consider artwork, is good for all seasons, but the added bonus of Doing good lighting, you'll just add more in the nighttime and in the winter time. ownership of the art that's been commissioned by the private sector. Um, it's, it's really interesting. For, well, first of all, the park is owned by the city. So the developer designed it, led the design of it, uh, led the public art components, and then it was conveyed to the city. So the city is responsible. We own the park, and we're responsible for the maintenance. By the way, we have also in, in uh, our guidelines is we allow the developer to hold back uh, usually up to 10% of the, of the art budget for maintenance, okay? So when it is conveyed to the city, we're also looking for, we, we were saying thank you very much for the art, but we also want to be able to take care of it, so that's really important. What we're dealing with though, and I showed the James Terrell in the lobby of an office tower, so we know that that will be taken care of. What's happening though at City Place and a number of other projects, and this is happening across Canada, is I don't think anybody really anticipated the, the condominium boom. So when we had these uh, policies in place, we hadn't really realized that so many of these buildings actually would be privately owned. So when the condominium, and I'd like Gabriel to speak to this, um, tr money is transferred to the condominium owners and the board. But you know what condominium boards are. They have their own priorities. They have standards, and they have leaky roofs. And they, you know, so it's, it's, it, it is a challenge for sure. I sometimes get a phone call from uh, an owner of a building, um, and when you take this card, say, it, uh, just an example would be, we have an Ingus E Day, the Brick Man, one of my favorite projects in Toronto, and they'll call up and say, you know, it's broken, and um, can you come and fix it? And who owns it? And I said, well, actually, you own it. <laughs> so I'm encur we're encouraging developers <laughs> to, to have in, in, the, in the documents when people buy condominiums that they understand what their responsibilities are. The building, the windows, the trees, the paths, everything that they have taken over, the art, they own the art as well. We also have in the agreements, though, that that art cannot be changed without working with the artist. So there's a Vito Acconci in Toronto that's very challenging work, and there's been some safety issues. Now, safety is a different thing, and, that, and we've dealt with lawyers and so on, but any changes to his art or anybody else's art, they need to get the artist involved, and so that's usually what we will do. We will have them engage the artist and talk to if there's a problem. Um, and so maybe you could speak to that too. Okay. Um, so in our case, we usually turn over about 5% of the construction cost of the public art to the condo boards. Um, but sometimes they go over that also, because for example, the roof lighting program you saw in every one of our towers, uh, in those cases, we actually, we calculated the, uh, the actual usage, the electrical, the electricity consumption, and also the replacement of the lamps, whether it's 20, like 20 year expected 20 year lifespan, 40 years or whatever, we work out a sinking fund so that they can put the money into the bank and draw a reasonable, reasonable amount of interest to, to maintain the roof lighting. We find that the, of all the public art programs we have installed to the condo boards, the roof lighting is the more challenging one in terms of long term 
um, maintenance because it's so easy for them to just switch a light off and <laughs> the whole thing will be off, right? Uh, so some of them, I mean, they initiated, they thought it was just lighting. Why don't we just turn it off? We don't like it and so on, right? <laughs> so, 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 so in one or two corner boards, we have to convince them somehow that this is really part of a painting the sky kind of composition. Uh, but actually, now with the more and more corner boards coming along, the more and more lighting on, they can see that actually it's all part of a bigger composition. So it's, it's, it's much easier now. At the beginning, it was challenging for one or two boards. Uh, but still, generally, to, when, when one do any lighting uh, for the public art, whether they're illuminating the art or whether the lighting is the art itself, we have to consider very carefully how durable, how easy to maintain, what kind of light sources, and are they, are they, are they have to be, do they have to be replaced often, and how, how easily people can switch them off, right? Uh, usually, we, we, nowadays, we hardwire them into the building <laughs> system, so they can't, they, there's no switch for them to, to turn it off, right? <laughs> What I did want to say and didn't mention, and those, uh, what you're asking about is uh, you're doing public art master planning and that's something like 15, 16 years ago and opportunities come along and it changes and, and the master planning, yes, it's at a very high level. What's important too is that we understand that funds should be pooled, okay? So one building might trigger a public art budget, but there might be a better opportunity that's across the street, still part of the developer's uh, project. Uh, and the beauty about this, and also uh, Concord ADEX is building another huge, how many acres is the one? 45. 45 acres in the north part of Toronto, so we're working together on that one too. Um, is, it's, it's a pleasure to work on master planning because very often with the recession that came through, you know, in the last decade and a half, very, most of the projects we get are one building and so it triggers one work of art. Uh, and usually they, we have a pretty good, or they have a pretty good idea what would be the site. It's the most publicly accessible part of the building. Uh, because they're condominiums, which are private buildings, it can be visually accessible. So it might be something that's inside. For the most part, it's probably outside, but the Barbara Asman, the, 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 the windows that I showed, the blue and green, the beautiful colors, those, you can't touch it, but you can see it. So, but pooling of funds is really important, I think, for both private sector and public sector, get some money together, but direct it towards where the opportunity is. But I think maybe Gabriel could speak to when opportunities have come up that we hadn't anticipated. Okay, all right. Yes, um, indeed, um, we always start with a master plan, including the art itself. Uh, but throughout the development of a project, which lasts 10, 15, 20 years, inevitably new things will change and new opportunity will arise. Um, and we find that quite often when we actually come to the actual design of a particular project, by then what is visualized in the pop art vision at the beginning is not quite suitable because the build form or landscape, something else would have changed and so on. Um, but actually also what, what we find out is um, when we start off a new development project, we don't really know what the public art will be doing there. It's like a blank slate, open book. And after a while, when the design is starting to take shape, then the opportunities will always start to arise. And together with our public consultant team, which is public art management, and also Jane and so on, so we, we collectively, with architect, landscape architect, we collectively come up with ideas to see how, uh, what the op new opportunities are. Um, in, the, in the new co design context. And of course, I mean, we have to always go back and check what was agreed upon early on in the, in, in the master plan, in the proper art plan, to see how, how much of a departure, or how close it is still with the uh, original plan. If it's too much of a departure, we will touch base with Jane and see the staff again to see whether they are uh, uh, you know, in concurrence with this slightly changed direction. So it's always a, a dialogue that way. But I guess in, in a sense, between, between Concord and, and the city, we have got a high level of trust, mutual trust that, I mean, if we say we we'll do something, we we'll end up doing, doing it. So, um, of course, I can't speak for all developers. I mean, if there's a long-term project by another developer, I guess there has to be more, especially if they're not, say, proven in doing public art program yet, you have to put in more checks and balances uh, so that they can just sort of, over the years, sort of squiggle away to, to, from the obligations. Um, but I mean, really, it, it, it depends on the level of trust you can, you can build up with the developer. But just generally, I think more, more developers, especially in Toronto, they are sort of uh, getting more and more sophisticated. They, re they realize the value of public art. So instead of trying to, 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 to shirk or get away from the duty, 
I think more of them are more interested to, to participate now. So yeah, that's exactly what we're happening. For, for example, we are, we are not, this is part of this presentation, but what we're doing in our North York project right now, we went through a, uh, a public art plan exercise uh, with local councillor, planning staff, chain, and so on. In that case, although, also we are, we are designing, actually as we speak right now, we're finalizing a design of another eight acre park in that development. It's a 40 acre development, so there were buildings around the park kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and we all collectively come to the agreement that if we do the public art on a block by block basis, you end up watering everything down, the impact may not be so strong. So that's why we all agree, okay, why don't we shift, collect the public art uh, budget from this six or seven blocks and put everything into the central park. Uh, and a little bit also for the community center and the, and the streetscape and so on, because the councillor wants to have more on Shepherd Street and so on. So there's a bit of a negotiation to see, okay, where, where to put the money and we pull the money. The pie is still the same pie, but just cut it in different ways. So I, I could also add that... Um so things change. You know, they'll, they have a, not Concord Index, but if a plan has come through, we've approved it, and then maybe the artist isn't available, or, you know, it does happen that they're not happy with the results. They come back in, they have a change in the plan. I then con looked at the agreements, I, looked, I talked to lawyers. Essentially, we've got a clause there. If there's a material change, then I have to report this, the change to the chief planner and then to city council. The material change being different amount, different, uh, d uh, well, not so much that, but it's more the lawyers say to me, are they still doing public art? Is it still that value? Are they running a competition? Is it still in publicly accessible area? And I say, yes, yes, yes. They say, well, that's not a material change. Then, then we can accept that. So, you know, things do change. There was a woman here has a question and then one more, and then I think we have to wrap up. It was a follow-up question okay. to the concept of pooling funds. Okay. So I understand if you're doing a variety of projects in a large development that you would combine all of your money but what are, what are the other options? Were, were you exploring other ways of pooling funds from multiple sources when you suggested that? Um, I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't understand your question. So if, if there was a certain amount of money available through Concord Pacific mm -hmm. to do something in a park, but mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be significant enough, and give, given that it's on city land, would you pool um, civic money oh. with, with the private development or, or vice versa? Uh, so uh, the, the question is, um, I guess, encouraging emerging artists. And, and because, yes, these are working with a developer who's spending a lot of money. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they want artists with experience. So we're asking the developers now to have a mentor program. And the art consultants, uh, there's a lot of resist behind them. Uh, they're, they're not that interested in doing it, but we're saying we're gently encouraging them yeah. to include, I mean, if you've got a multi-million dollar budget, please, you can find 10 or $20,000 to support a local artist, essentially to shadow the winning artist. And so I think that's really important. The other half of it, which I didn't talk about, is the city's projects and the city's responsibility uh, for uh, mentoring artists and running competitions. That's a problem, though, because it starts with a call for qualifications. And you immediately eliminate a number of artists. So we're, we're, I think we're all grappling with that. How do you get the new, new ideas and new artists involved? On the private sector part, as I say, mentoring is, is one way what we're trying to do. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Actually, um, what we like to 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 do a lot is to work with younger artists. Actually, um, to have established artists, uh, well, they, they cost more first of all, usually, and <laughs> which is an important factor. <laughs> Secondly, they could become prima donna. They, they may they, they, they may not want to collaborate as well as the younger artists who are more keen, right? So, so question, when we when we engage artists, they are, they are, of course we look at the whole spectrum, age, ethnic, and cultural, whatever background, and so on, artistic background, and so on. But we also we, we end up tending to, to work with young artists. But then when we work with young artists, that, that there's a challenge sometimes that they have, they are not that experienced in doing art which is durable, and long lasting, right? And this is totally different sort of skills that they have to really know about the materials and construction techniques and all that kind of things. So what we do is, uh, and again, it's over the years, we, we build up a, a pretty good team internally. We have got, again, the public art management team. They are very versatile in, 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 in sourcing material, construction methods, and all that kind of um, issues. And we work with them, and also our engineers, landscape architects, as the case may be, to, in a sense, sort of um, uh, 
nurture the younger artists to work together with us. So quite often, I mean, some one one two artists, we start to walk upward. They don't even know what concrete is, basically, right? So, 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 so we go through a sort of a, a program with them, and after one or two, 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 two um, public art programs with the younger artists, they start to sort of have the wings and can, they can spread and fly. So we also treat that as sort of like an education program also, uh, which I think is beneficial for, for, for all parties. Um, and just the Toronto Public Art Commission, which is a group of volunteers, when we look at the public art plan the developer brings in, we do want a balance. And if there's a, the developer is suggesting only international artists, we're saying, you know what, there's, like, there's no one in Toronto, there's no one in Canada. So we encourage them to include either a local or a national artist in the competition, give someone a chance and a try as well. So, you know, trying to get a balance of, of different kinds of opportunities. It was uh, planned in the early 80s, mid 80s, Ken Greenberg, he was the director of urban design. They had a vision. And they had an architect who was the public art coordinator at the time. They, they, they did their research. They looked at the programs in the United States and did some cherry picking. Because as I said in my slides at the beginning, we knew, or they knew, that it's happened. It's not a new, it's a new, not new. But I think what we have to remember is what planners, and I'm a planner myself. By the way, I, I have an art background. I became a planner when I went to, after I went to the city because I realized how interesting it was. Um, but, it, you know, developers don't want to be held up. So you have to figure out a way that it's efficient, it'll work for them, it's not going to hold up their, their, their development and their scheme and their openings and so on. But I think it's really more that you give them examples. And I think once people see what public, what artists, well, there's my lunch, <laughs> what artists can do, they go, okay, I get it. So, uh, so at the beginning, it, there was a lot of resistance for sure. I started in the late 80, uh, 89, no, 91. And sure, very conservative developers yeah. coming in and saying, okay, where do you want the art? Sure, give them examples because there's, there's hundreds of them across Canada and in the United States now. And I think that's what they need to see. We also tell them to take advantage of the program. You have to do a window, you have to do a wall, you have to do whatever. Have an artist involved. The public art won't pay for all of the window. It's that upgrade. It's what makes it special that that's the public art component. But I really think it's, it's simply visuals and showing them examples. And it's what other developers do. And someone like, like uh, Gabriel Lung and Concord Adex showing examples of the largest condominium developer in Canada. They're doing it. So why isn't somebody else doing it?